So thank you very much for the kind invitation, Nathan, Rob. This is a, a lot of fun. Um, my name is George Hemingway. I run the innovation practice for Stratalis, and I'm here to talk about the three keys to conquering uncertainty in mining. We're going to tell a couple of stories here. Along the way, we'll talk about digital transformation and just about everything in the kitchen sink. But at the end of it all, hopefully you'll think a little bit differently about the future, a little bit differently about what's coming, a little bit what different, differently about what it means for a mining company. So uh, I'll sort of launch kind of into it a little bit. I'll spend two seconds talking about uh, what I do, as I mentioned, I run the innovation practice for Stratalis, and we are a growth strategy and innovation consultancy, and we focus on helping companies to think a little bit differently about the future, especially companies that are in industries that are going through a lot of change and a lot of uncertainty. And we do this by helping them do three things. We help them to develop a future focus by developing some foresight around what's happening in the world around them about the future itself, about helping them become more flexible so that when change happens, they can sort of pivot and adapt to it, and helping them focus as a company on where the value is. And we do this for lots of very big companies and lots of very interesting industries. So you'll see that while we do work in mining, uh, helping companies do everything from set their mind of the future vision to think differently about the future, uh, we do work across a wide array of industries. And that's important because I'm going to spend a lot of time not talking about mining. But I promise I'll wrap it back towards the end because there's a lot to be learned from banking, a lot to be learned from transportation, a lot to be learned from lots of different industries. And well, there are plenty of experts in mining in this room. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about things that have nothing to do with mining seemingly, and then bring them back one more time. So we live in very uncertain times. And if anyone wants to disagree with me, I'm happy to have a 10 hour long conversation with you at the end of this talk. I mean, if you look at what's going on, uh, technology happening incredibly fast, things that were science fiction just coming to life. If you look at the political spectrum, I mean, wow, the last year has just been amazing. If you just look at the last week, what's going on in terms of, in terms of geopolitics and trade and potential conflict, we live in uncertain times. Of course, we've always lived in uncertain times, right? We, we ourselves in the present seem to think we live in more uncertain times than, than everyone that came before us. But what's different about today is the rate at which change is happening. It's just happening blindingly fast. And as humans and as companies, we have a really hard time dealing with that. But look, uncertainty isn't all the same. When we look at uncertainty, we look at it kind of as a spectrum, right? There are some things that we're pretty certain of. I am pretty certain. You see, when you say this sort of thing, you kind of ask yourself, man, maybe I shouldn't say it. I'm pretty certain that the sun will rise tomorrow, right? I've got some clarity around that. And when you look at certain technologies like uh, 3D printing, pretty certain that 3D printing is going to have some sort of impact on the world, right? And we've got some clarity around that, right? And then there are some things that, well, you know, we know they're going to happen, but we don't quite know how they're going to happen. Let's look at um, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, artificial intelligence is likely to occur, but how it's going to happen, what the scenarios are of that are, are sort of unclear. There's more than one way that this can, this can translate. And then you've got things you've got absolutely no idea what's going to happen. Just, you know, will there be a, a war next week? Uh, could an asteroid hit the Earth? Will we develop some technology that fundamentally takes over everything and changes our lives next year? Who knows? These are things around which we're truly uncertain. We can play around, but we don't really truly know. And so when you think of uncertainty, and when we look at how companies who perform well in uncertain times do so, they do three things really well. One, they face the future. They think about tomorrow, the trends, the behaviors, the uncertainties, and they consider them. Two, they don't just consider what victory looks like, but they consider the showstoppers. In fact, oftentimes they spend more time on what could stop you from achieving your vision than they do on what it takes to achieve the vision itself. And then third, they realize that, well, no matter how good your crystal ball, you're going to get it wrong. And so they're prepared in how they've designed their operating models, in how they've invested, in how they've thought about their people to pivot. Because no matter how good you are, you just, you're just not gonna get it right. And if you do, it's just luck. So when we look at the future, when we think about the future, when we consider it, we realize that as human beings, we have this, uh, this bias around how we think about things. We think that the future is a solid place. We set five-year visions, 10-year visions, three-year visions. And then, you know, we figure we're going from here to there, and it's just very, very, very easy. We can kind of set that path along the way. But the reality is, as we all know, right, that, that I, I, see, when I was 18, I thought I was going to be a Broadway singer. And, and well, 
I'm not a Broadway singer. Because the world doesn't follow the vision that you set for it. It's an uncertain, crazy place. And what happens is, though, we set strategies that are either precisely right or usually precisely wrong. And everything in between is this kind of reality gap. And that's all uncertainty. But that's as, as human beings, that's how we think. And just to put it in terms that, that we can all understand, I'm going to talk about turkeys. <laughs> so now I'd like you to imagine for a moment that you are a turkey. And you live on a turkey farm. It's a wonderful turkey farm. Lots of places to run, lots of turkey friends to play with, lots of food to eat. High class operation run by Donald Trump. Okay? <laughs> and let, let's say I go to you on this turkey farm on, you know, the 100th day of your life. And I say, assuming I spoke Turkish, hey, Mr. Turkey, how's life? You might say, you know, I got a lot of food, I got a lot of friends, Donald Trump is my landlord. Life is pretty good. And then, Thanksgiving. Now the mistake the turkey made is the mistake we all make. It's the mistake companies make, whether they're mining or financial services. It is that we view our past as an indicator of our future. And this just, you know, the important thing is to realize that we do this. And when you start doing that, to ask yourself, well, am I making assumptions that just aren't there? And, well, not be a turkey. So when we look at the future, when we think about the future and we say, well, now that I've done this, shouldn't I be able to, to predict what's coming? Well, you have to realize that the problem is, as I mentioned before, change is happening faster and faster every day. Now look at this handsome looking gentleman. I, out of curiosity, this is 1990. Uh, who in this room, apart from me, owned nearly all these gadgets 20 years ago? Okay, we've got a couple of geeks. I feel, I feel good. I don't feel, I don't feel alone. That, that, is not, that is not me. I, I still like to think I still have the, the hair though. Um, so, now here's the interesting thing, and I, and I think you know, many of you may know where this is going, is that this was all well and good. 20 industries, you had to buy them all to fit them in that room. But overnight, 2007, iPhone. 20 industries absolutely, totally disrupted and gone. And it's only been 10 years. It's only been 10 years. And you could have sat there in 2006 and said, hey, you know, I'll just keep making record players or, 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 or handheld video things or cameras or whatever the case is. I'll be fine. But you weren't. And you're not. The space of 10 years, they're all gone and they all fit in your pocket. And as companies, what do we do when this kind of change comes along? Well, generally speaking, the bigger you are, the more you ignore it. You look at Uber and you look at the taxi industry. And I choose this period of time because it's very dramatic, right? Uber shows up. What does the taxi industry do? They say, eh, it's cute. Forget about it. And then they say, well, wait a second. That, that's, that's having an impact. Well, let's protest and, and let's riot. This is especially popular in France. That doesn't work either. And so what do you do? You use your power, your economies of scale, your scope, and you get the regulators and the politicians to do the job for you. And sometimes it works. But the truth is that overall, the industry has been so disrupted by that point that it will never be the same. There is a point to this with mining, and we'll get to it. But just take a look at this and imagine the 1,400 to 400 rides per taxi in a period of two years. What business can survive that kind of drop in overall revenue, production, however you want to look at it? And when you think about the speed at which change is happening, a few years ago I showed this simulation of autonomous vehicles running through an intersection. Just a few years ago, I think it was here in Canada at the World Mining Congress, Montreal if I recall, maybe it was 2014, I, I'm, 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 I'm a little off, but something like that. And I had to show a simulation to describe what might happen in the intersection. Simulation? Who needs a simulation? We've got these things on the road. We've got autonomous trucks. We've got autonomous cars. I mean, really, the big hurdle isn't the technology. In a few years' time, we've gone from a pipe dream to something that each of us is now contemplating what we're going to do with our time. I have people, someone talked to me on the plane yesterday. I don't know what I'm going to do with my time if I can't drive to work. Imagine the impact it's going to have on road painters and sign makers and intersection lamp people, or how about the auto insurance industry? If you're in the auto insurance industry, have you considered who's buying insurance in a world in which cars don't crash? And if they do, the driver didn't do it. Again, we need to be ready for that change and think more about it, especially when it's coming quickly. But change is not the enemy. Change is good. The problem is us and the fact that we try and resist it. So when it comes to the future and when it comes to uncertainty, 
Back again to the three keys, facing the future, considering the showstoppers, and preparing to pivot. I'll start with my first of the three keys, facing the future. And that really is some of the funnest part of the work that we do, because we spend a lot of time helping mining companies think about the future, think of their mine of the future programs and what it means for their operating models and their business models and their organizations. And when we do that and when we look at it and we cluster all of what we see happening, we see six major technology clusters occurring. Now you may feel there's one missing or one that shouldn't be here. McKinsey's got theirs, we've got ours, you've got yours. But fundamentally, all of these technologies will impact the industry. Now, I'm not going to spend time going through these, but I'd like you to focus on just two for a minute. Artificial intelligence and automation robotics, and we'll come back to that. But all of these things clustered together are thrown under the word digital. When people talk about digital mining and digital transformation in, in mining, they talk about all of this stuff. And of course, how you define digital and what it actually means is a whole other conversation for a whole other day. But we slam this under digital, and it's interesting because a fellow that runs strategy for one of the mining companies uh, came to me about three months ago and said, George, we have to figure out this digital thing. Ah, the digital thing. Doesn't matter if it's banking or mining, people are asking us to think through the digital thing. But when you look at the digital thing, and you can't escape the digital thing when talking about the future now, when facing the future, it turns out that people spend a lot of time talking about technology. Why? Because in an uncertain world, technology is something you can grasp, you can touch, right? It's tangible. We like tangible when things are uncertain. And why not? Things that are science fiction are now becoming science fact. But the thing is that digital is not about technology. If you spend your time facing the future and thinking about technology, you're going to make a mistake and you're going to miss the real change that's happening. Companies that face the future and do it well focus on two things. Value, where it's coming from, and vision, having a very clear one of what it means for their business. And I'm going to talk about each of these for just a few minutes. Back to Uber. I'm going to spend a lot of time on Uber because they're just full of fun. They may implode next year, but they've got stories to tell up the wazoo for us. So if you look at Uber, what did Uber do when they came into the taxi industry? Well, first of all, they came into an industry where people wanted change. Customers wanted change. They were sick of the incumbents. They were unconstrained by the operating platform that other um, taxis, the taxis had, right? They didn't have all those costs. They were willing to ignore or play by new rules than their competitors were. And the capital markets treated them differently than they did all the other competition. They basically threw money at them even though they didn't make money, and I don't think they do. Now it's interesting, because when you think of the mining industry, and you ask yourself whether it's an industry where people want to see change, whether it's constrained by lots of cost, whether it plays by a set of rules that it believes are fixed, and whether it plays by a traditional set of capital market requirements, you wonder, well, is the mining industry like the taxi industry? Well, maybe, maybe not. We'll see. There's another industry that had similar challenges. Netflix came in to the DVD rental industry against Blockbuster. And what did they do? Well, here's the interesting bit. Lots of unhappy customers existed when Blockbuster was around because Blockbuster made its money with late fees, right? Just like, just like you know, just like a lot of people still do. And what they did is even though late fees were only 18% of their revenue, they were 40% of their profits. Well, people hate that. So when Netflix showed up and said, we're getting rid of late fees, people flocked to Netflix. So what does Blockbuster do? They get rid of late fees. Problem is, they were so fundamentally stuck with their operating modeling costs that they had to reinstate them because they had a $300 million gap. By that point, they were toast. Nothing you could do because fundamentally they couldn't fix the basis around which they operated when someone came in playing by a different set of rules of the game. Same sort of thing is happening in retail right now. When you look at Whole Foods, just bought by Amazon, and you compare them to, say, Walmart, 44th consecutive year of dividend increases, or Target, that's been increasing their per share dividend for the last five years, you realize that poor Whole Foods trying to make money, as you know businesses are supposed to do, couldn't compete. I mean, they just didn't have the model for it. So Amazon comes in buys Whole Foods, the market rewards them by increasing their total value 3% on the day they bought them, which by the way was more than enough to make up for the cost of Whole Foods. It was. <laughs> In fact, I think they maybe took a little home and bought some champagne just to celebrate with the extra. Dropping the market value of the competitors like Walmart and others by 7 to 20% over that same little blip of time. Why? Because 
Amazon is playing by a different set of rules. The market doesn't care if they make money or not. There's this, this perception that, hey, you're trying to compete with people that are making money, but you don't have to. If you're a company that's trying to make money, trying to compete with people that don't have to, how do you play? Especially when everyone else is holding you to the same rules that you've had for the last 100 years. Now, it's true, mining is not retail or taxis. It's an entirely different business. It's filled with uh, regulations and compliance and rules and your price takers and there's lots of market risk and political risk. Okay, but mining is a little bit like banking. And I know this because I've spent a lot of time in banking recently, helping banks think through the future. They've got a lot. Every time I try and suggest something with a bank, they say, well, you know, <laughs> regulations don't really allow us to do that. Um, or I don't know what happens, you know, that's just not something we can go ahead and do that. And well, we don't really control the rates. So mining's a little bit like banking. Let's look at banking for a second. Banking is a very process-driven business. They have processes that they do, and they're attempting to make them better, but it's the same processes. They're not able to adapt very quickly, and frankly, they've got a pretty lack, big lack of focus on the customer. After all, they make money on fees, just like, you know, Blockbuster did. That's how they make a lot of their money. Now, because of that, they are facing some interesting challenges. Regulatory pressure, safety, uh, uh, compliance, and so forth and so on. They've got declining margins, and they feel like pressure to cut cost. And that should sound somewhat familiar, so what the banking industry does is they push fees to the customer, lots of unhappy customers. Now these technology giants like Amazon and Google, and before you say, well, wait a sec, they're not in banking. Amazon has loaned $3 billion in the last few years, a billion in the last year alone. And they're playing in this area. They'll be in there. And what are they doing? They're not worried about making money, they're worried about growth. They're trying to be quick, they're trying to experiment, they're trying to create a great customer experience. Lots of unprofitable but happy customers that are happy to leave banks. Now what are banks doing? Banks are trying to go digital. They are trying to really fix their value, fix their basic um, operating model. And same product, same silos, in, in organizationally, same rules, just fa better, faster, and cheaper. Right? Faster is very important. You were talking about speed. And that's great. That's fantastic. It's going to help tremendously. I mean, in some ways, mining companies are doing the same. Better, faster, cheaper. We do the same thing. We're just doing it a lot better, faster, and cheaper. But here's the interesting thing. Technology players aren't trying to optimize the existing model. They're not trying to work from the basis of all that capex and infrastructure that exists. Oh no. They're just trying to find some way to leapfrog the whole thing and deliver something very specific, profitable or not, who knows, but very specific, and leapfrog the entire industry. And what does this have to do with mining? Okay. Here's an idea for you. Now, Apple came out about a month ago and said, you know, we are making a commitment to use 100% recycled metals in our phones one day. Now, the one day means that, well, no one's quite figured out how to make that happen. But one day, with a big enough backer, will happen. And when it does, and you've figured out a way to take all that metal that's out there and all those minerals that are out there and recycle them, do you still have to mine? And Wait a sec, if you figured out a way to do that profitably enough, could you sell them to people other than Apple? Could Apple sell them to other people? Could Apple become a mining company? And how does a mining company compete with the different rules? Okay, let's say Apple doesn't happen. What about the undersea people? What about the asteroid people? Whatever that looks like. It won't start with the same infrastructure, it won't start with the same rules. And the market would be more than happy to throw money at something that has the opportunity that it does. How does a mining company compete? So one of the lessons here is that digital may not be enough. Digital is not enough in some industries. In mining, digital, simply optimizing what we do, but doing it faster, better, and cheaper, may not be enough to be prepared for the future. The second part of facing the future is vision. This is something that inherently we understand because we all work in business and we spend a lot of time talking about setting visions. And when we help companies set visions, we do something called future casting. It, it sounds cool and it is. And we cluster together trends and uncertainties and lots of neat things to help companies think about the future. Whether it's the future of transportation or, or the future of retail or the future of mining, we realize that not all visions are created equal because most of the time as an industry, because we don't have this future mining company yet, we tend to talk about one vision of the future. 
It's autonomous, it's mechanized, it's, it's uh, predictive analytics, it's remotely operated, and so forth and so on. But the truth is there's more than one potential vision for a mining company. You could be, if you're a financial services company, you could be the McDonald's of banking. Cheap and easy, everywhere. You could be autonomous, serving everyone one-on-one -on -one, but with computers. Or you could be, like a current client of mine, saying that, you know what, we have a duty to the country that we're in. We're not going to fire people even if we can do fully um, autonomous um, and artificially intelligent driven banking. No, we're actually going to hire more people and we're going to move to a more service oriented business model. Most banks wouldn't even think of doing that. They would. Each one of these makes sense based on the, on the trends of today and the opportunity, but each one is different. Back to Uber. I told you I was going to talk a lot about them. Here's a thought for you. Someone came to me and said, tell me about this Uberification of mining thing I heard at some conference. This was a, a few months ago. What does this mean? What is, is, is this Uberification of mining? And I said, well, you know, it's interesting. I was speaking to a former head of innovation for one of the mining companies. And he said well, when, he, when he went ahead and, and looked at what drove the greatest value for their company, it wasn't necessarily mechanization or, or automation. It was better understanding of the assets. And what they found is that, you know, they could buy this mechanized robotic stuff kind of not off the shelf, but at some point they thought more or less everyone would have it. And in fact, if everyone had it, would everyone be at an operational parity point when the machines correct and fix, independent of ore body and all of those other things that are specific, if you will, to a, a mining project? But if you get two equal ore bodies, would you basically have two more or less equal operating platforms from a cost point of view? And if you did, how would you differentiate and compete? So if you think about it, the world's largest taxi company owns no cars. The world's largest accommodation provider has no rooms. The world's largest content provider, a media provider, makes no content. Could the world's largest mining company own, or at least operate, no mines? Just focusing on trading in and out of it. You're nodding your heads because, well, someone's already kind of thought about that, starting it. You could see it progress. Look, the point is, whatever your vision is for the future of mining, you've got to have one. And you've got to understand how it drives your decisions today towards some future sense of value. Because quick wins do matter in setting a vision because you need permission once you face the future to bring people along for the ride. And you've got to convince them that you've got something. But quick wins alone isn't enough. So we get to our second key to conquering uncertainty. Consider the showstoppers because victory means achieving victory, not just setting a vision of victory. So it's, it's interesting, when you consider the showstoppers, and when you look at the companies that do it well, I come back one more time to Uber, oh, you look at companies that do it well, you realize they spend a lot of time thinking about the scenarios of the future, what could happen, and how they can either take advantage of them or mitigate the risk inherent in them. Because risk, you know, like uncertainty, isn't a bad thing. It just, it's, a, it's a thing that needs to be considered. It's neither good nor bad. It simply is. Now, when you look at Uber and all the technology that made it happen, the, the payment cards and the GPS and, and the digital stack, whatever the heck that means, and the doodads that make something like that possible, it's not the most amazing part. The most amazing part is her. And the reason is this. Because we, as a society, politicians, regulators, mothers, daughters, sons, husbands, are okay with someone standing on a street at 2 a.m., hailing a total stranger in their car, giving them their address and their credit card information, having her drive them home and leave them there safely. Now, I can't imagine, you know, my mom uh, asked me a couple of months ago, you know, she landed in Chicago, how do you get home? I said, mom, take an Uber, I'll order you one from here. I can't imagine myself 20 years ago telling my mom, hey mom, just, you know, hail down some random stranger, get in his car, uh, you know, give him some money, you'll be fine. Because it's the humanity, it's the, it's, it's the acceptance that we have that is the greatest change. It is also the greatest showstopper. Because as we look at innovation programs and change and transformation, we, noter, we notice it's not the uncertainty of feasibility. Can't, will the technology work? It's not the uncertainty of implementation, can we get it in there? It is the uncertainty of acceptance that we see as one of the single greatest showstoppers to the mining industry transforming. Will people allow us to do it? So when you consider what's been going on the last few years, you look at um, 
Occupy Wall Street, Tahir Square in Egypt, you see a growing discontent in the public. There's a widening gap between the rich and the poor. There's a feeling that, that people's lives aren't as good as they were before, or that the generation before had it better than they did, that there's some fundamental unfairness going on. And we're seeing that translated into the political spectrum as well. Brexit, Le Pen in France, Trump in the US, different levels of nationalism, isolationism, post-globalization, all those strife translating into political changes and regulatory changes as well. This is the world we live in. It just is. It'll come, it'll go, but this is right now. What's interesting is that who's being blamed? Businesses are often a large target of this, whether it's the pharmaceutical companies, the financial services companies, or the mining companies. And while all of this is going on right now, what's coming to the forefront? Artificial intelligence and automation robotics. Artificial intelligence has the potential to replace all of the white collar workers, the lawyers, the, the doctors, the engineers, the consultants, yes, even the consultants. And robotics and automation has the impact to replace everyone that actually does physical work, the blue collar. Now, whether you believe this to be true or not is secondary to whether everyone else believes it to be true as you go ahead and you attempt to change. And what's interesting is if you look at the most populous job in the United States from 19, the most common job from 78 to 2014, all that baby blue is truck drivers. It's interesting because it's also kind of mirrors the people that voted for Trump. Um, now, the interesting bit is you look at a few years ago, Budweiser and Otto came together. This is an autonomous truck. This is not new. This is, this is old. I've been showing this for three years. Now imagine tomorrow we decide to switch all of our trucking to robots. One more time. Let's look at that slide. And consider the world we live in. Will they even be allowed to try? So <clears throat> the interesting bit is that even folks that believe that blue collar workers can be replaced don't believe that white collar workers can be replaced. This is an interesting little thing from Watson, IBM, lovely branding tool, but it's an indicator of something greater. They tested oncology um, or, or tumor recognition, um, as I understand it, with IBM versus a team, I think, from MD Anderson on who would do a better job of diagnosing cancer. One got it right 90% of the time, one got it right 50% of the time, and you already know that it wasn't us. So if doctors are replaceable, maybe we all are replaceable. Now, when you look at who's going to do well in transforming mining, what countries will absorb it better, we've got some thoughts. We think that countries that have a history of a lot of change, that have been through many transformations, the internet age, the industrial age, quite successfully, that have a robust economy, or that have a, a control over their populace, hello China, will probably do better than others. US, Canada will probably make the transformation better than other countries. But when you look at countries that are economically eh, not as strong, that maybe have unrest or challenges, when you look at countries, in fact, where a lot of mining operations are, Brazil, South Africa, so forth and so on, and you ask the question how you're going to implement this change, we think these will be the sorts of great descent. So this is an interesting thing. What's going to happen is people's perception of mining, their brand of mining, its past, is going to conflict with what mining companies actually view as the future. And that conflict is going to lead to some sort of socio-political pressure and strife because you can bring back all the coal jobs you like, but if the coal companies don't really want you to do that, because what they want to do is put in autonomous mining machines, there's going to be a gap between what we would think mining is and what mining companies want it to be. So I called up Mark Kudafani. I said, Mark, what do you, what do you think of this? You know, is, is, is this any sense of my, am I off my rocker? And he said, no. The ability to transform the industry is going to be incredibly important from a speed point of view and a success point of view based on whether or not mining companies can manage the societal outcomes. And that's why you see him talking an awful lot about that. Right? Because at one point, it's the humanity that's the challenge, not the technology. And the question is how you develop the social construct that makes this possible. Now, he had some ideas. He said, you know, there are three things that, 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 that we're doing, and I'm sure those have changed over time, but among them, they are one. You've got to think about using the infrastructures you've got to create other benefits. In other words, in plain English, 
If you're taking something away, you've got to replace it with something else. You've got to be smart about the speed of adoption. In essence, just because you can automate everything tomorrow doesn't mean you should. And finally, you've got to consider added support, which is a fancy way of saying all of this may not be enough. At the end of the day, mining companies have some sort of obligation, a contract with the communities that they're in. And simply recreating, creating new benefits and matching the speed may not be enough from a financial point of view to balance it out. And so this may just cost money. And there may be ways that this has to be dealt with for a generation or two, a sort of gap of un discomfort between what a mine looks like and what the community can support. The funny thing is, even if you manage to put robots in your minds and you fully automate and do artificial intelligence, it may not be enough because it, 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 <laughs> the European Parliament apparently is trying to give them rights. You got robots unionizing. So great, you go ahead, you put the robots in and now, you know, they want three hours off for lunch. So what do you do? Again, it seems like a joke, but it's not. People are sitting here and talking about this stuff. And it doesn't mean that it's not a glimmer of something that could happen, a showstopper worth considering, which gets us to our third key to conquering uncertainty. Be prepared to pivot. As I mentioned, no matter how good you are with your crystal ball, you're going to get it wrong. You think you've got clarity. You've got a grasp around the scenarios. But the truly uncertain will always evade you, no matter how much you try. Now, a company that's done well in pivoting is Netflix, right? They started out competing with video stores, brick and mortar, sending uh, videos in this thing called the mail. It was a paper envelope. You, you put something in it. It was a stamp. You put it in a metal box. Someone came and picked it up, dropped it off at another metal box. It's fascinating stuff. All right. And then they realized that, you know what? It wasn't the DVDs where the opportunity was with the customer. It was bringing this content to them at home. So they competed with the cable companies, the little box. And they realized that you know, people aren't going to the movies anymore because they're doing such a good job of that. So they competed with the movie theaters. And finally they said, you know what, it's not about the pipe. It's not about the channel. It's about the content. We've got to be everywhere at all times. So they started making content. Now they're one of the biggest buyers and producers of content out there. In just a couple of years, it's fascinating. And then the most fascinating bit is that you know, companies get good at doing one thing and then they do it over and over and over again. They never stop until they fall off the cliff because it's not needed anymore. They stopped, and they're defending for a bit, just to see consolidating their position. That's quite an interesting point of view. They're also spending an awful lot of money buying this content. But it is interesting from a strategic point of view, pivot, 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 defend. Because their operating model, their business model, and their view of the future allowed them to do so. I had a client that came to me. This is a chemicals client. Um, works in the automotive industry <clears throat> with a very simple binary choice. Do we or don't we invest in a new manufacturing plant? Very big investment, right? Lots of, lots of capex, lots of time in a specific geographic location. For them, it was a yes or no decision. And we talked to them a little bit about the scenarios of the future. Electric cars, Uber, Chinese regulations. And they realized that, you know what? The industry is looking really uncertain. It's so uncertain that I don't know that we want to invest in a geographic location in a world that seems tenuous from a trade point of view. I don't know that we want to invest in an industry that's constantly changing faster than we can figure out. But we're number one. We've got to invest. We've got to do something. I mean, it's still attractive. So what they did is instead they invested in containerized solutions. Basically, making your factory bigger as demand increases by sticking it in a container micro factories, and then reducing it as demand dropped. And they did something that they'd never considered before. The number one player in an industry sat back and said, what's our exit strategy? At what point do we start to see these signposts, these glimmers, these indicators that the market is starting to turn so we sell our company at maximum value? Again, thinking about the future, considering the showstoppers got them to an entirely different operating model an entirely different business model, an entirely different strategic point of view than not considering the showstoppers and being prepared to pivot. So I asked Mark about this one more time, it's turning into an advertisement for, for Mark over here, but nonetheless, he's got a point that pivoting is important. But what he thought was interesting was not just being flexible, but being able to see things happen and adapt to them more rapidly, developing the capability in the mining company to move 
faster, not just from an operating point of view, but as human beings. And he's absolutely right. It's a mental thing. It's not just a mechanization thing. So finally, I'd like to leave you with one thought that, you know, I told you that all of this isn't about technology. Despite the fact we're talking about innovation today, innovation is more than just technology. It's how you operate. It's where you operate. It's how you think and how you organize. And I believe that in the future, victory is going to require a human touch. Because the technology will happen. The question is whether or not we will be ready to go along for the ride. So those are our three keys to conquering uncertainty in mining. You've got to face the future. You've got to consider the showstoppers. And you've got to be prepared to pivot. And thank you very much.